29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, uh, good morning everyone to this week's meeting for the Committee for the Communities. In the room with me today I have Andy Allen on Starleaf. We have Mark Durkin, we have the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, we have Alex Eason, we have Sinead Innes, we have Karen Mullen and we have Robin Newton. So you are all very welcome um, to the meeting today. I am going to start off then with Agenda Item 1, which is apologies. Do we have any apologies? I know, Alex, you had said that you need to leave slightly early. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, Chair, sure. I apologise. I have to bring my mum to a hospital appointment, so I'll have to leave just about 10 ish. That will do. No problem. Um, I will move on then to <laughs> Agenda Item 2, which is draft minutes. Uh, members, you will find the draft minutes for our meeting on the 6th of May 2021 at page 6 of your meeting pack. Can I ask, are you content with the minutes as drafted? Content. Content, thank you. Okay, sure, sorry. So go ahead, Kelly. Can I come in? Uh, sorry, I'm having a bit of problems. I have two computers going here, and one is, um, I just want to make sure, um, page five, could we go to, I think that's page five, sorry. Um, it's basically about the post office card. Okay. My, yeah, so the post office card. Um, there is a concern about this, and um, I'm wondering, as a committee, can we get um, clarification? Um, I know that they've sent us the information that they have, and it's very welcome, but there are a number of concerns. As we know, when someone is paid um, benefits, um, any account that that goes into um, is accessible by the department, obviously, if they need to reclaim money. But there is an issue coming forward with PIP uh, and DLA because... Um, we're, people are being told if the person cannot get a, a bank account because they don't have the ID or whatever that may be, and this applies to a lot of people who have quite severe disabilities, that they can then have their money transferred to a, an account of a son or daughter, well, a, a brother or sister or another member of father or mother. Um, However, we need factual clarification on that. How much access will the department or will DWP have to that bank account and how will the access be used? Because um, there's a number of people who are saying that it's all very well and good saying that the post office is coming to an end, but the alternatives that are being suggested online at the moment are concerning an awful lot of family members um, who may work themselves and therefore wouldn't qualify for benefits, but their bank account, because it's going to be used for someone who has disabilities who is, or who is unable to open a bank account, um, their, their bank details will be accessible by the department or DWP and how will they be used? Okay, well, we're happy enough that we take that, those proposals forward. Are members happy with that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, look, can I just go back again because we're just we're in the draft minutes here. I need the draft minutes to be um, d that you're content with them and agreed. Can I ask that that first and foremost that they are agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. And then are we agreed then with the proposal set out by Kelly? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that's fine. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move on then to agenda item four, which is, oh no, sorry, agenda item three, I'm missing out that part, which is chair business, person's business, and uh, which is really exciting because I have nothing to report this week, so I will move on to agenda item four then. Uh, matters arising, so can I inform members uh, then that after our further discussions in the relocation of the Model Engineer Society at last week's meeting, we had an update on Friday from David Heatley from the Society, and he's been contacted by William Blair from NMNI requesting a meeting for a mutual update. Um, so it's just to make you aware of that. There's nothing in the pack on it, but it's to make you aware of it. Um, so we, let's hope that um, things progress a bit further there. So then I'll just go on then to inform members. You've been provided at page 30 with a response from Sport NI on the breakdown of the sports sustainability funding. And as requested by the committee, additional information specifically on funding to grassroots sports organisations and to organisations with a specific focus on women or girls or on people with disability. Members, you'll recall um, that the fund opened for applications on the 4th of December 2020 with an available budget of £25 million. The programme closed on the 20th of January for applications and 37 recognised governing bodies um, uh, applied. So just again to ask any comments on that, are you content to note that letter? 
Kelly, go ahead. Chair, sorry, um, I just wanted to ask, um, we've had con discussions in the Assembly Chamber, um, and I, I don't know if this would have been applied um, for this one, but gender budgeting, um, it would just be interesting to know, um, I'm, I'm guessing that this um, current funding would not have included that, but it would just be as a follow-up to this, is the department intending to adopt gender budgeting going forward? Because that would help with these types of reports, especially if we're looking to find out about sport um, investment in women's sport or disability sport. If there was a gender budgeting um, lens put over it, it would certainly help. Okay, I have no objections to that at all. Um, other members agreed with that? Yeah? I mean, it is something, certainly the Women's Caucus has been discussing it, and um, yeah, there, there's been various discussions around that within the Assembly. Um, uh, I know in saying that, I know, um, because I chair the all-party group on Women, Peace and Security, <coughs> that the Minister for Communities has responded positively um, around support for women, um, so uh, just, to, just as, as a by-the-by -by there. Um, but, I mean, I'm happy enough if we want to ask that question. Other members content with that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, members. Can I move on then? Happy for me to move on? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Then can I ask you then to turn to page 33 where you'll see a departmental response from the Department of Finance uh, in connection with committee discussions in relation to living over the shop scheme. The committee had requested if there was potential for the NI civil service office buildings to be considered for use by the housing executive or for social housing purposes for town centre living um, if the buildings or floor of buildings were no longer required. The Department of Finance has advised that surplus assets um, follow the Department of Fi Finance's D1 disposal process. Um, as part of the public sector disposal process, qualifying public and third sector organisations can express interest in surplus land and property and acquire without an open market disposal. Um, the prior disposable market value of all surplus property is assessed by land and property services. Um, again, are members content to note that, or do they have any comments they want to make around that? Content? Content. Okay. Yeah. Then can I ask you to turn to page 34 of your pack, where you'll see a response from NICFA in relation to the effects, effects of COVID-19 on the voluntary community sector. They've said since March 2020, NICFA has carried out seven successive surveys of its members and the wider sector on the impacts which uh, of the pandemic um, has had on them. The most recent of these surveys carried out in November 2020 found that the top three most pressing issues facing organisations were sustaining our organisation and activities, finance, cash flow and changing our services to meet emerging needs. NICFA also highlighted its concern around the 21-22 budget and that funding shortages will lead um, to their organisations coming under increased pressure to meet, their, to meet the unmet need. Um, I just wanted to suggest to members, would it be useful to invite NICFA and CO3 in to brief us at a future meeting? And we'll be discussing our, our forward work programme later on in the meeting. But um, can we add that to the list? Members are yeah. happy? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Okay, Kelly, did you want me to comment there? Yeah, I did actually. Um, I'm, I'm very um, interested in the fact that NICFA has raised on page 37 um, the full cost recovery element is not being paid by health. Um, I don't know why not, um, because under the Concordat Agreement, you know, the community and voluntary sector are to be treated as equal partners. Um, why they wouldn't be paid the full amount for the services that they're um, being provided with. There are plenty of other contracts that allow 15% um, administration, and that um, should certainly come across. I'm not sure, Chair, um, whether we write to the Health Committee or it's it's the Health Department, or if we write to our own minister to ask what is the um, position of our government with regards to full cost recovery and charities. And then hopefully if we have that information, then we can discuss that with Nick Fu whenever they come to see us. Yeah, we can do that. Certainly, I'm more than happy to write three to the health department to ask about their rationale on that. Though I know, having spoken to some of those voluntary and community groups or organisations, rather, um, full cost recovery is is um, sometimes not what they want because it doesn't allow them the necessary um, freedom 
to do some things that they need to do. Um, so I think that would be something that uh, whenever NICFA and CO3 are in as well, that we need to ask that, you know, is that the what is the general broad view uh, across all of the organisations on that? But I, I mean, I have no difficulty writing to the Health Minister um, to ask what his rationale is behind um, the, the percentages that are, that are awarded to those organisations. Members happy enough for that proposal? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on that, members? Are we happy to move on? Yeah, move on. Okay, then can I ask you to turn to page 40, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the women involved in community transformation or the WICT programme. Um, subject to ministerial approval, the department plans to issue an open call via a grant funding process for all eligible organisations to apply to deliver a developing women in the community programme. This process will be open to organisations in areas identified as being most at risk to paramilitary influence. Um, the new enhanced programme is expected to commence delivery in September 2021 and in the interim to ensure that there is no gap in service delivery. The current partners have been offered the opportunity of an extension until the 30th of September 2021 while the new programme is being developed. Um, I know this is something that I certainly met with uh, uh, women's organisations about, and I know other members have as well. Um, and uh, you know, right up until the end of March, they were facing redundancies and everything else. So I, I, I just want maybe we need to get an update as well from those programme uh, delivery partners as to how that has emerged for them. Um, I mean, it is it, it's good news that this has been extended. Um, and it's going to be a new and enhanced program, which is also good news. Um, but I think we need to maybe. I know that, that we have been contacted by certainly one of the partners, our delivery partners. So maybe just we need to go back to them also and ask how smoothly has this transition been? Um, because I know they were certainly left to the last minute. And I know Andy, you've been speaking as well um, to someone on this. Yeah, sure. I, I continue to liaise with them, and I think um, the information flow back and forth between the, themselves and the department has not been great. So. Um, I think it would be useful uh, if we're able to liaise with um, TWN uh, and the other delivery partners to better understand um, where they currently are with it, um, and I'll continue to follow up with them as well. No, I think that's a good idea, because it is, it's an extremely important programme that has done a wonderful, wonderful work with many women across all of Northern Ireland from all communities. Um, so that, it's, uh, it's maybe we need to learn, and the department, and we all need to learn those lessons that you can't just all of a sudden be facing redundancies and then, um, then receive a letter two days beforehand or whatever to say we're continuing on. Um, Kelly, you wanted to make a comment? I was just going to ask, um, Chair, you mentioned it earlier, the Women's Caucus is, is looking at this and, and they have been tasked by the Speaker and the Assembly um, to look at um, you know, where there are projects that are involving women um, and how we can support them. I was just wondering if it might be possible if we could um, send a copy to the Women's Caucus just so that they're aware of the good work, actually, that Communities is taking forward. Yeah, I think, that is, I think that's a good idea. Um, for them to be involved uh, with this also. And just, again, it just highlights those issues around all of those funding programmes. And I know many of, uh, including myself, have worked in the voluntary community sector and just how precarious that can be for many people. So, no, if members are content with those proposals, that's, um, I'm happy enough to move on if you are. Yeah? Okay. All right, then can I ask you to turn to page 42, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the public petition to ban conversion therapy? Um, the department advises that research and policy work has begun to inform the drafting of legislation to ban the conversion therapy alongside work on the executive's LGBTQI plus strategy. This work will also scope out the exact timescale for delivery. Again, can I ask members, have they any comments on that or are they content to note at this stage? Content to note? Content to note. Okay, members, then can I ask you to turn to page 43? where you'll see a departmental response in relation to neighbourhood renewal outcomes. Uh, the departmental <coughs> press release on the 21st of April on neighbourhood renewal funding related to the announcement of the annual neighbourhood renewal budget, which the Minister had maintained at the previous year's level of funding and was not therefore an, an announcement of additional investment. Um, attached to the response is a briefing which describes the current outputs focused approach alongside a copy of the performance management framework. The framework details outputs 
which are included within the Department's contracts for funding with neighbourhood renewal funded organisations and are directly attributed to the one or more of the four overarching strategic objectives of community renewal, economic renewal, social renewal and physical renewal. So again, I'll ask members, have they any comments they wish to make on that or are they content to note? Kelly? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, there is an issue here. Um, while the programme is very good, there's a gap in service provision. Um, the Minister has been in contact with me, um, and to be honest, I'm fed up with being pushed between pillar and post on this one. Um, we have rural communities, our, our population density of, of 2,500 or less, um, and then we have urban as defined as 5,000 or more. Um, unfortunately, there are a number of rural um, towns that fall between 2,500 and 5,000. Um, the previous minister given had said that this would come into um, the people in place strategy and that the neighbourhood renewal would include those areas. And as such, then, for instance, in my own constituency, there has been and quite an extensive amount of money um, put into applying for neighbourhood renewal for those areas that were deemed that would fall into communities' responsibility. That's those over the 2,500. Um, but as has happened, their applications have been turned down. Um, can we write as a committee, possibly to the Minister, just to say um, it's not enough um, that it's between DERA and themselves. There's a gap in provision there and we need it to be dealt with. Um, either Minister Gibbons' direction has to be implemented or the Minister needs to come out and state that she's not going to fund and supply provide support for those um, towns that fall between and it's passed to DERA because we need clarification on that. Okay, that's a good point. Um, members, any other comments on that? No. Uh, Sorry, Mark, I know we lost you somewhere there. I just got a message to say you'd lost connection. So if there's anything uh, anything that we've discussed so far you want to bring up or go ahead. No, I'll drop it back in there a, a wee while ago. In terms of this uh, paper we've got back, I know it gives an explanation of the, the approach, but what I'd really been looking for was an analysis of performance and impact to date. Uh, you know, and, and, and there doesn't seem to be any of that here. Uh, does, does does that exist? I wonder, and, and, and can we get that as a committee? Yeah, I think that's good points as well, and certainly we can ask for that also. Well, because if, if they're talking about a, a review and, and changing the approach as part of the anti-poverty strategy, which I b believe ne needs done, we, we need to see performance to date i.e. why it needs change and that will better inform how it's changed as well and, and monitored going forward to maximise the impact of this investment on the communities and, and people that need it. No, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's that issue again of data gathering and making decisions based on on the data and based on, on uh, what has gone before. So I think, no, I think you're right. Um, I'm happy enough with that uh, proposal. Um, are members any other comments or happy enough with what's been proposed? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, um, members happy then that I move on to our next uh, piece under uh, matters arising. Couldn't even think where was that. Um, can I ask you to turn to page 43 where you'll see a departmental response in relation to job start and in addition, in the tables, papers, the department's response dated the 26th of <coughs> April. Our previous queries on the scheme is included just for your reference also. Um, when an employer applies for funding from the Job Start scheme, the employer has to provide details of the occupational and employability skills that young people can gain from taking up their job opportunities. Employers are also asked to outline what support will be offered, who will provide the support, how it will be monitored, how the young person can provide feedback during their opportunity, and how this will be acted on. Responses to these areas are considered during the assessment of the application, and an employer will be asked to provide additional information if there are gaps. In addition, when an employer returns their funding agreement, they must also supply a detailed training plan for each job opportunity created. Employers who are successful with their application will receive £1,500 funding per job opportunity for set-up costs and support, and they can work with other organisations to provide employability support. Um, the set-up payment will not be made until the department is satisfied with their training plan. 
uh, extensive engagement events have taken place with NICFA, disability organisations and youth organisations. Again, members, any comment? I know, Robin, you had brought up the issue about uh, these young people and, and qualifications. Um, yeah, Chair, it's quite, a, quite an interesting letter from the department. It uh, does not mention that the young person will complete the course uh, with a qualification, nor does it mention that the young person will be enrolled for a qualification, um, nor which body will be awarding bodies. Um, so it's an interesting letter from the department. Okay, thank you, Robin. Kelly? Um, thank you, Chair. Chair, I'm, I'm somewhat disappointed by this letter. I find it a little patronising. Um, I don't know it's quite strong language to use, but um, to say to a committee that we've already answered your question in, you know, as it says there in the second line, you know, first question related to geographical spread, um, I have to say that the Job Start scheme is not a standalone. It was set up in one week. Uh, what happens in that one week will never change. Um, this should be an ongoing process. Um, I would like us to write back to the department to ask them for a rolling update on when the geographic or where the geographical spread of these job opportunities are, um, because it's just not good enough to say we've already told you about this. Um, that means that the department's at a standstill and they're, they're not actually promoting this any further. Then I have to ask the question, um, the answer that we were given before was not good enough and what they have said now is not good enough. This is a, a hugely important scheme. We have, as we know, a huge number of young people who, as an outcome of COVID, are not in employment. And this is an opportunity to help some, not all, some of those young people to access employment opportunities that will hopefully lead to permanent mm -hmm later. Um, if there isn't a good enough geographical spread, we have to be able to scrutinise that and we have to be able to question the Minister and the Department on that. So I'm not happy with the way that they have answered this. And I'm much like Robin has already said, it lacks a lot of detail. And I appreciate its early days. But in that basis, then um, I would be asking if we could write back to the Department to say that we are provided a written update on a regular basis um, to confirm the progress of this scheme. Okay, thank you. That's Perfectly acceptable for the committee to do that, absolutely. Any other comment any other member wants to make on this? Then can I then just say, um, members, are you happy with the proposals that have been put forward that we action those? Yes. Sorry, Chair, can I just ask you, in terms of actioning the proposals, are we asking the questions as to which uh, awarding bodies are involved in the scheme? Yes. And indeed, which... Yeah, we're asking those questions. Yeah, yeah, I think that was what you would. I think that you've, yeah. I mean, you've asked that several yeah. times, and there hasn't been a definite yeah. answer. Um, so I, I think Kelly's right. It, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a great response. Um, I think you, and you'd said that also. So I think we go back and ask those further questions. Um, members, you. members, happy that I move on to the next piece. Yes. Okay, then yes. we're going to, excuse me, we're going to move to page 62, where you'll find a departmental response from the Department of Health in relation to funding for the voluntary and community sector. The department has provided funding of just over £6 million to community and voluntary organisations in 2020-21, and a breakdown has been included in the reply. Again, can I ask members, are they content to note that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then can I ask you to turn to page 63 of your packs where you'll see a departmental letter in relation to amendments to the Northern Ireland Social Security legislation required due to the introduction of a child disability payment by the Scottish Government. Um, work is underway between the Department and the Scottish Government and the Department for Work and Pensions to identify any potential issues as a result of the changes being brought forward in Scotland. The aim of this is to ensure as consistent an approach as possible and minimum disruption for any individuals moving between here and Scotland and vice versa. Some issues have been identified which require a legislative solution. However, the department does not have the consequential le legislative powers to make these series of changes. Therefore, the amendments are being brought forward at Westminster by statutory instrument alongside GB changes. Um, again, members uh, content to note that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Chair, could I ask, um, 
Could, would it be possible for us to get a comparison? Um, I, I agree with what we have received. It's, it's, it's perfectly acceptable and it, it makes sense for people who are moving to Northern Ireland. But um, could we possibly get a comparison between the changes that Scotland have brought into the um, child disability payment compared to what we have here? Um, it might be useful, and I'm sure the department are considering this as part of the welfare mitigations, but it would be useful just to see the differential between what's happening in another part of the UK and here, and if, if there's any lessons we can learn from what Scotland's doing. Yep, absolutely. I think that is a, a good idea. Um, we can certainly do that. Uh, members, any other comment? Are they content with Kelly's proposal? Yeah. Uh, members, before I move on to our next agenda item, um, Janice has just passed me a message to say that she's just um, been informed that the department uh, will be running a TV campaign, or they are running a TV campaign. Um, for awareness and promotion around the job start scheme. So that will be, um, if it hasn't already started, that will be rolling out, uh, which will go right across then, um, all of Northern Ireland, uh, to make uh, for that awareness. So it's just to make you aware of that, um, just as a point of, of clarification. All right, members, that is um, chair, or sorry, that the matters are rising. I don't know why I keep saying chairperson's business. Because um, I didn't have any today, I think I was maybe why. Uh, can I then ask you all to move if uh, we're, we're ready to agenda item five, which is licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill agreement of report. Um, members, we began the consideration of the report at our meeting um, uh, just on Tuesday past there, the 11th of May, and a number of changes and additions were suggested. The amended sections of the report were then circulated to members for comment, followed by a second version with some additional comments. The second version is in your table papers. Uh, members, we now need to read this into the record that the committee is content with the new sections of the report. Okay, so if members got their, their, their table papers open, then we'll start um, with the committee deliberations on the bill. And I can I ask members then have they any, any comments or are they content with the section as amended? Content. content thank you. Then we'll go to clause by clause consideration of the bill. And I'll ask again if members have any comments or are they content that this section is amended? Content. Or as amended, rather. Yeah. yeah. And then can I finally then ask members, are you content that the, the text of the committee's report is now final and can be published? Agreed. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. I know. We should all give ourselves a round of applause. <laughs> oh, no, it just feels that way. Okay, members, then we're going to move on to agenda item six, which is a departmental briefing on the COVID-19 charity fund. Um, you'll find the papers for this agenda item in your, your tabled pack. And then um, can I welcome to the meeting Joanna Gray and Ian Greenway. Um, just just before we start, I'm just checking in here because we're doing everything new here at the moment and we've got Antoinette who's managing all of the cameras. Are you going to move our members into the audience then? Yeah, okay, members, you're going into the audience and Joanna and Ian are coming into the spotlight and Andy, go ahead. Can I just declare an interest, Chair, as a charity trustee, please? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, Joanna and Ian, you're both very welcome to the meeting this morning. Um, if you would go ahead then and begin your presentation, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can indeed. Excellent. And, and, and thank you for inviting the Department to attend the Committee's session today to provide information on the COVID-19 Charities Fund. I'm here as Programme Director for the Fund. As you will know, I'm also Director of Historic Environment Division within the Department. I'm joined today by Joanna Gray, who is the Fund's Program Manager. The committee hopefully has been provided with a background paper setting out key facts and figures relating to the COVID-19 Charities Fund, and our apologies that came belatedly to you this week. I will therefore keep my opening statement brief and try to not to repeat the contents of that paper to maximise the time available for members to ask questions on issues of particular interest to them. Our local charity sector is unique and we hold it very dear. People here are very generous, reportedly giving more to charity than any other region of the UK or Ireland. In return, our charity 
churches play a vital role in supporting people and knitting together the fabric of our community. We estimate that there are just over 8,800 charities locally, and we began to receive reports in April 2020 that many were in grave difficulty because of the pandemic. The Communities Minister immediately made a commitment to help charities so that they could continue to help others. Many of our charities locally are small. Often they are the sort of groups set up by concerned citizens who feel there's a gap in provision or in response to a personal tragedy or locally felt injustice. Over one third of charities, 36%, had an income of £10,000 or less prior to the pandemic. The vast majority of these groups have little, if any, unavoidable costs and were simply able to hibernate during the crisis. Only a small number, 4% of local charities, fall into the large category with an annual income of over £1 million. 60% of local charities are therefore medium-sized with an income of £100,000 or less. We expected these charities to be in most need of help as their income from trading and fundraising had reduced significantly and they would face ongoing unavoidable costs like rent and insurance with little or no free cash or reserves to fall back on. In late April and into May 2020, so just over a year ago, we scrambled to develop a policy framework and put in place approvals and all the paperwork required to distribute the £15.5 million budget allocated by the executive as quickly as possible. We put together executive papers and a business case, commissioned delivery partners and developed guidance notes, application forms, scoring frameworks and promotional material to ensure as many charities as possible would be made aware of the funding available. We are very grateful to colleagues across the NICS and neighbouring jurisdictions who helped by sharing information they were receiving from their networks and charity partners. We're also very grateful to local sectoral partners, including NICVA, the National Lottery Community Fund, the Community Foundation for Northern Ireland, Community Finance Ireland, Social Enterprise Northern Ireland, and others who provided additional advice and real-time feedback and survey information. We accepted at the outset that our, the available data were suboptimal and have committed indeed to improving our own in-depth knowledge of the sector quantitatively as well as qualitatively. We accept that we do not have enough strategic information about income breakdown. How many charities rely on trading income, fundraising and or grant awards? Or a good enough understanding of their resilience and ability to adapt when needs change? Issues with local charity leg regulation following Justice McBride's High Court judgment also complicated the situation as we were unable to rely on registration status as an eligibility criterion. Throughout our engagement with the sector in a co-design process, the key priority was determined to be preventing the closure of as many local charities as possible. When the fund first opened for applications on 15th of June 2020, we anticipated that the crisis would likely have abated by late 2020. Therefore, support was offered for unavoidable costs in the period of 1st of April to 30th of September 2020. In phase one, 500 cha 501 charities were supported with £8.8 .8 million. Pounds. By late 2020, it was clear that the sector needed further help, and a second phase was rolled out to support a further 386 awards with £7.2 million, that phase covering 1st of October 2020 to 31st of March 2021. So in total, 887 awards were made across the two phases, but as 188 charities received awards in both phases, a total of 699 individual charities have been supported. The fund was well received by the sector, and both delivery bodies have been praised for their fair and proportionate approach to distributing the funding. That was National Lottery Community Fund in Phase 1 and Community Finance Ireland in Phase 2. The £16 million awarded by the Charities Fund, along with £9.25 million awarded through DFC's COVID Social Enterprise Fund, brings the total emergency support dispersed to charities and social enterprises during 2020 to 2021 by the Department to over £25 million. Ongoing engagement with sectoral partners suggests that the sector continues to need public funding support as trading income and fundraising is not expected to return to normal levels for another six to nine months. 
a bid for £10 million allocation to support charity and social enterprise sectors in the current financial year has therefore been submitted, but has not yet been met or determined by the Executive. Should additional funding be made available, the previous policy framework will be revisited, taking account of lessons learned, including why the final assess need was lower than expected, and to revisit some aspects of the policy framework. Further analysis is therefore underway to consider why excess need did not meet expected levels, but emerging thinking suggests a number of factors had a bearing. Firstly, sectoral survey information proved unreliable, possibly because trustees, perhaps unfamiliar with their charities' detailed financial information, and concerned, as we all were at the outset a year ago, about the potential scale of the crisis, overestimated the actual impact. Both delivery bodies reported that some applications were of a poor quality, demonstrating limited understanding of the charity's own financial information and an inability to calculate needs in what was a fluid and changeable situation. Local charities are accustomed to managing on very tight budgets, and so for many, financial, financial challenges were managed very effectively by adept and experienced staff, volunteers and trustees. We expected fundraising income to be significantly reduced and that, that was the case for many charities. But some charities continue to report that donations remain steady, and in fact, in some cases, the pandemic made people give more generously. Some of the funds criteria have been challenged, and we intend to revisit some aspects of the policy framework should further funding become available. This would include reconsideration of the maximum award cap of £75,000, eligibility of charities headquartered in other jurisdictions but delivering some services here, and the organisation of some churches which may have impacted distribution of funding. The fund was developed in a highly pressurised environment, but benefited from input from tirelessly dedicated select sectoral partners. Its development contributed to a new level of respect and understanding between officials and sectoral partners, which we are committed to nurturing for the longer term. Our Minister is determined that we will continue to build on these relationships, these new ways of working and the responsive pace exercised during 2020, as we continue to deliver outcomes for the sector and for our local communities into the future. Thank you, and we're very happy, Joanna and I are very happy to take members' questions. Um, thank you, Ian, for your briefing and your paper as well. Um, we know as a committee that we did have, um, over the, 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 the last year, on various occasions, um, representatives from um, the, the charities, whether that was CO3 or NICFA, in to brief us. And we know at times um, they felt in sheer desperation. And um, we were glad to see when, when that money did get rolled out. Um, I note from your paper um, that you've said that there, there may be the further looking into the future, the financial need of around 10 million um, for this financial year. Um, can you then just uh, let us know, has that funding been secured and will it be administered in the same way as it was in phase one and phase two? Thank you, Chair. We have made a, a, a bid to via the Department of the Executive for £10 million for this current financial year, 21-22. We anticipate those needs being in the early part of the financial year, um, with the current trends as we foresee them around, around the pandemic and restrictions. Though that bid, along with a number of other bids, are due, are yet to be considered by the Executive. If the Executive did vote money for charities and social enterprises, we, we would envisage a single fund, last year we ran two separate funds, but there's a large overlap in charities and social enterprises, so we would anticipate a single fund operating, using a delivery partner um, as previously, with many of the same elements of the framework, but I mentioned in my opening statement there are a few areas we feel we, we, we do need to look at again. We would do that in co-design with the sectoral reference group, um, and we would welcome any input from committee members on on elements that they feel need revisiting. 
And I suppose that, I mean, that's very true. I mean, during the pandemic, pandemic, many funds were set up and we needed to get the money out there as quickly as possible. And lessons have been learned across the board, um, just to, you know, some were, were needed tweaked in some way. And that's perfectly acceptable. I get that. It mentioned there about the charities um, uh, who uh, are based in other parts, possibly of the UK or Ireland, um, and then have, uh, have offices here. And we know that caused great <coughs> problems. Um, for many charities. Can you just get a, give us an update of how you propose that will work going forward? I'm going to pass that question to Joanna, please, Chair. Joanna, we you, can't hear you. Are you on silent, Joanna? I was, I was on mute. Can you hear me okay uh, now? Can indeed. Okay. So, yeah, we refer to these charities as 167 charities because that's the section of the Charities Act um, that refers to charities that are headquartered elsewhere and registered elsewhere but have some services um, being delivered here. And we did think about these charities at the time of developing the um, policy framework for the Charities Fund our understanding at that time was that other jurisdictions um, were offering funds in England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland um, and that those funds would uh, allocate funding to charities registered in the, those jurisdictions that were in need. So essentially they'd be taken care of in their headquartered jurisdiction. Um, so we prioritised local charities who wouldn't have access to those funds in other jurisdictions so even where a local charity would be delivering services, say in Scotland, they, um, we expected that we would have to take care of them here. Now, we have had some feedback since that um, other jurisdictions did accept um, uh, applications from charities that were re uh, based here, headquartered here, but delivering services. So that's why we want to look at that again. Um, the issue that we will need to unpack and we need to talk to the sector and we have already spoken to some charities that are in this category of this 167 where they're, they're, they're national charities usually um, delivering services here is how we can um, help them unpack their own financial information because these large charities tend to take donations um, perhaps legacy donations that are made to the charity as a whole without um, any specific you know, requirement for them to be used in a particular jurisdiction and that means it's difficult for them to unpick their finances to demonstrate what their local need is in terms of their local income, their local expenditure and therefore their local deficit um, and that was something that um, both of our delivery bodies had reported to us that you know they would need to be able to see that financial information clearly in order to make reasoned judgments and that that may not be so simple for those charities. So yes, it's something that we really do want to revisit and we're very aware that some of them didn't lose out because even though they may have been able to access funding in other jurisdictions, it didn't filter down to their local satellite um, offices. I know it was something that certainly came up in committee several times and on this this part 167 of the Act, um, I think it was, was it, I stand corrected if it wasn't, the British Heart Foundation who've been waiting a very, very long time um, for, for the issues that they have be rectified. Um, so it, it's good to know that those conversations are taking place because we did hear from those charities who did say that they didn't necessarily um, pick up um, from the, from the, the GB uh, grant funding um, to the same extent that our local charities picked up here. So that, that that's good news and that I welcome that. So I do. Uh, members, I have a few hands up. I have Kelly, then Andy and then Karen. Um, so I'm going to go over to Kelly first and bring Kelly in. Um, Go ahead, thank, you very much. thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you very much, Ian, and thank you very much, Joanna. Um, can I just start off by saying a huge thanks to your teams um, for getting that money out. Um, I know that there was it was an emergency. We were, in the, we were in the middle of a pandemic and it's a bit like our welfare system. You know, if it hadn't been for the people behind making sure that the money was out, we would have been in a lot worse situation. And um, of course, a huge thanks to all of our community workers and charities um, who, to be honest, provided a lifeline um, during that pandemic. I know in my own area, from the 
absolute numbers of volunteers, you know, contacting people who were in isolation, self-isolation um, and delivery of meals. It was fantastic. But my question really is for yourselves is coming out of this, obviously this was a huge piece of work that had to be done with no time. Um, what learning have you taken from it? I used to work, as Ian would know, in a 167 charity. Um, you know, obviously you recognise that there's an issue there with the reporting mechanisms and how that money's recorded. But what learning is there that we could take forward as a committee, you know, to consider, and when we were talking to the department and talking to the minister, um, that we can help more or what is it that we need to be asking of the community and voluntary sector going forward and and is this new partnership working which to be honest is wonderful um you know how can we improve upon that thank thank you kelly it was all done at pace we were just reflecting yesterday joanna and i preparing for this that it was over the bank holiday weekend at the beginning of may last year we were joanna morrow Doherty and I with Tracy Mahag were going back and forwards on the executive paper. It seems like another lifetime, but it was just a year ago. I think the rapid mobilization that we were able to make was absolutely vital. And that was pulling in people like NICFA, people like CFNI, um, as if you like surrogates for a leadership group, because one of the challenges here was with very many charitable organizations, 8,800, the, the, it's informal structures, informal leaders, if you like, like Seamus McAlevey, come forward. But how that sector can have a coherent voice across all of the places in Northern Ireland and all of the types of activity, whether that be animal welfare or education or health or transport or whatever it may be, I think that's a real challenge. That then leads to some challenges of actually understanding the sector, the sector itself and the department, um, NICFA has a state of the sector report. It's not solely confined to registered charities, if I can use that phrase in light of the McBride judgment. It's, it's broader. But as we started to drill into that data, we found it was fairly broad brush. When trying to compare it with data from returns that were made to the Charities Commission, we couldn't make these different things add up and connect. And our view of 15 and a half million and how far it would go was therefore framed by that data analysis as best we could by a different bodies co3 nick for others saying what they felt the need was in a rapidly changing situation when everyone was in a, a level of crisis we all were in our personal lives as well as our professional lives but the the data and, and having better understanding of data how we can proportionately for charities gain that data probably through the, the registration process with the Charities Commission. But even at that level, smaller charities can put in free form accounts, if you like, to Charities Commission. Larger ones have to use standard formats. It may all seem a bit tedious and man from the person from the ministry, but to gather data to understand what's going on, we need some standardization, proportionate standardization of some of those things. So connections for the department, and we'll hold our hands up that... The pandemics taught us things in all sorts of ways. I remember a colleague in DFE saying to me, in the height of the pandemic, we never realized we were responsible for hairdressers because hairdressers had simply got on and done their business. It became a, a key issue at different points. So we had worked hard to build connections through the, to the sector, through NICFA and through elsewhere, but it was clear those need enhancing, need solidifying from both sides, and then... I'm a bit of a data geek myself anyway, but understanding the data and really being able to drill into it so we can all with confidence say, actually, there's a real problem over in making this up. But in the west of the west of Northern Ireland, particularly in, in health or it's in the north of our education. So we can really mobilize ourselves and respond tactically as well as strategically. I think I don't know if you want to add anything, Joanna, but they, they were two key learning points that came forward for me. I was just going to say, I was just going to make, to reinforce that point, which I think Ian has already made about the relationships, because, you know, we, we like to think in the Department for Communities that we do have good relationships with that we had pre-existing good relationships with the sector. But I think the pace at which we were working this time last year, we really solidified that, you know, we had a series of meetings um, with the sector, with the sectoral representatives and also across government that were so fast paced, it was it was sort of breakneck speed. 
And I remember um, in one of those early meetings, some of our sectoral partners saying, look, um, you know, this is kind of at, at the beginning of May. Some of the sectoral partners saying this money needs to be in bank accounts by the end of the month. That's how desperate charities yeah. are. And we had to say, well, look, we, we, we get that, but we have to get the approvals in place. We've got to design the criteria. We have to design scoring. We need to appoint a delivery body. We have to publicize that the money is available. We have to open and close for applications. We have to let the delivery body score it, and then we have to make payments. And, you know, it's probably not going to be possible to do that within three weeks. And, you know, but we worked at that breakneck speed and we had some things where we said, right, OK, that's the decision. Let's move on now because we've got to try and do this as quickly as possible. And I remember Andrew McCracken from the Community Foundation Northern Ireland saying, wow, that's how the sausage machine works then. And I think they really got an insight into, you know, some of the stuff that just is, is absolutely necessary because, you know, we did try to keep really good governance around this because we wanted it to be so fair um, one of the few things that we did have to drop was full public consultation. So we tried to do that engagement as fully as possible as, a, as an alternative. And I think it also gave us a really good insight into what the sector is up against, some of those umbrella bodies down the charities themselves that we really understood. You know, we're normally behind that veil, but we really started to understand what day-to-day -day life is like for them. And it has been such an enriching experience for our relationships to be built up, you know, and improved by that experience of being in the trenches together, I suppose. And I think that's amazing. Um, and thank you very much for that. I know that um, I worked for 16 years in community and voluntary sector um, through transport, and I, I got to know Ian through that. But um, I have to say that as a community, somebody who worked in that community sector, I didn't have, if you imagine the person that's working in that community hasn't had a fixed term job contract. I, like, I only ever had a one year contract at a time, but you're so committed and you believe so much in what you're doing. And that's what I was wondering, just, I know that we have the Concordat agreement and I know more already had been working before COVID and probably through COVID on the Concordat. Um, we've heard today earlier in our um, discussions about um, health doesn't provide full cost recovery and, and the services that they buy from community and voluntary sector. Is there an opportunity with that group to consider further how improvements can be made? Because I do think that that relationship that you guys now have with the sector could maybe help to address how you know, branches that are of 167 charities that are working here, um, who are delivering services here, like that's important for our community, um, that they, what they need to provide and what the accountability can be, um, the understanding, of course, that you can't have double funding where you're getting funding from one area for Northern Ireland and then trying to apply for it again. I'm just wondering if um, going forward that there could be a review of that. I know that one was happening. Um, and then the final thing I was just going to ask is, um, the £10 million, absolutely welcome, and hopefully we'll get that confirmed through the executive as soon as possible and that money goes out, because we are still, unfortunately, dealing with the outcome of the COVID pandemic, um, and, and, and those charities are still continuing their work. But I'm just wondering what next. I know that this committee has been quite concerned. If we have the £10 million coming out, br brilliant, but an awful lot of those organisations have been funded in the past through European monies, and we're hearing that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, you know, is going to have a, a sort of a, an interim um, proposal coming through. I don't know how much preparation is there for the community and voluntary sector who have helped so much um, to be ready for significant changes that are potentially coming down the road. And can we not warn them off, but um, bring them into that discussion as early as possible? Okay, um, so I'll take that because obviously my, I actually come from the voluntary community division within the department, whereas Ian's obviously on the heritage side. So um, in terms of reviewing, first of all, um, well, as the committee knows, the, the char there is a review um, of charities regulation, which is underway at the moment, and that will consider all of those things, including, um, I expect, a consideration of the parts of the Act that haven't yet been enacted, which includes Section 167. Um, but in addition to that, the department has been very, very um, taken by the, the, uh, the ability that we demonstrated last year to adapt. And as I say, those relationships um, that, you know, really just came on leaps and bounds. And our minister has made a strong commitment that we would um, continue 
um, to embed some of the lessons learned from that. So there is um, within the voluntary and community division a piece of work that I'm actually involved in as well um, to look at our grant distribution processes for a start because obviously we were able to drop some of our um, more bureaucratic processes in the height of the pandemic last year with, um, we believe, very little impact on good governance and assurance and therefore we want to embed some of those things going forward and that includes looking at things like full cost recovery and the ability of organisations to repo profile between salary and running costs, for example. Um, the other thing is the relationships piece, and there is a piece of work ongoing as well through the joint forum under the Concordat to look at you know, how we actually um, embed some of those lessons learned around relationships and really start to treat the voluntary and community sector um, as we should be as an equal partner who bring as much, if not more, to the table and that, you know, recognising that government has strengths and weaknesses, the sector has strengths and weaknesses, but actually together, we, you know, we can make a really good, strong partnership that, that fills all of those gaps. Um, and on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, um, yes, we are aware that um, the sector does sometimes, has, you know, historically struggled to access some of those direct European funds. And obviously, as a competitive fund, um, this could also have challenges. Um, what I will say is our minister has um, already extended the flexibilities from last financial year um, to through this financial year for all of our um, grant awards, and that includes organisations being able to reprofile and you know flex their their day to day activity to do what they need to do to continue to um, support the their beneficiaries in the communities that they work in. So that gives them a little bit of breathing space. Um, and certainly the department is um, recognises that we will need to play a role to help those organisations sort of refocus from what previously might have been European funds um, yeah. to make sure that we get our fair share there from the um, from any UK based um, replacement funds. Um, the other thing that you mentioned there, Chair, was the, the, the bid. Um, we have had some sectoral feedback that's suggesting that um, the sector could still be six to 12 months away from a full kind of rebound to recovery. Um, obviously, um, you know, retail income elements like charity shops be able to reopen um, and hopefully are benefiting from that kind of pent up demand at the moment. But there is an expectation that that will tailor off and that it will take a while for footfall and activity to return to normal and obviously a lot of charities did derive income from other things like training you know, and, and charged services which just maybe haven't returned to normal yet so we're trying to keep our finger on that pulse um, just to try and work out how best we could um, distribute any further support from money that's allocated. I think that covers it all. It certainly does. Just uh, I'll pass you over to uh, back to the chair again but just before I go please do pass on to to yourselves and to your teams, our absolute respect um, and my absolute thanks for um, the work that was done. It was a horrendous time for all of us. Um, the, when we think back to what we were all faced with in that first lockdown and, and, and the amount of deaths, unfortunately, and people who were catching COVID and the hospital pressures, but to have a community and voluntary sector, and I know the civil service working with them, that helped to get that help out um, was is something very precious that, that we do have to recognise. So from the bottom of my heart, um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, I have Andy and then Karen. So, Andy. Thank you, Chair. And at the outset, can I just echo the comments of thanks um, right across the department <coughs> in the sterling work and rolling this much needed fund out. Uh, I'll try to keep my comments concise to allow other members to come through. Um, Ian, can I just very quickly just pick up um, on the total amount across all phases, indeed, including that um, allocated to the hospices and the the Cancer Fund for Children, how much was allocated in total to the department uh, for the various charity funds? The, I'll, I'll keep myself right and make sure Joanna keeps you right. The executive provided in April, May last year, 20.5 million pounds, which was available, of which 5 million was taken away by Department of Finance for hospices, including the children's hospice. So there was 15.5, on 5.5 million pounds made available to the department for the charities fund in what became phase one of the charities fund. Then of that, 
Um, nine, let's keep myself right, eight. Find my numbers so I, so I don't mislead anybody. Um, 8.8 8 million pounds of that was expended. So there was less than we had allowed for in the budget. In phase two, we bid for an additional five million pounds because we didn't believe the balance would be sufficient for that October to March phase. So that brought the total that the, the executive had voted to the department, if you like, up to 20.5 million. Um, and there was 7.2 million dispersed in the second phase. So in total, we dispersed 16 million. In addition, then the social enterprise fund was um, voted seven million pounds. The demand there was higher than anticipated, so, so 9.25 million pounds was paid out, and that was made available from, from those funds, that extra 2.25 million. Okay, I, I can see why you took your car there. Um, so, um, can you confirm no monies were returned back to DOF um, in respect of being underspent? Well, as I've set out in those numbers, we were in total a small amount underspent. I'll work my maths out in a moment, but um, the committee will be aware there were other funds being administered by um, Department for Communities, including for Culture, Languages, Arts and Heritage, which was oversubscribed. So in total across all of the funds that um, were managed by Department for Communities, there was an oversubscription, so there wasn't any returning of money to Department of Finance, correct? Okay, no problem. Um, and also, in terms of feedback, um, concerns or otherwise, um, how does the department intend to implement that? Is there an option for a, a strategic approach? And I know NICFA and other organisation representative bodies provide uh, valuable training. Is there an option for the department to look at training packages, for example, for the charity sector? You'd made reference to the state of uh, perhaps applications from the feedback from the administrative bodies. Is there any consideration being given around perhaps fundraising uh, training, uh, application training, et cetera, with, in conjunction with Alexa NICFA, even uh, utilising NICFA's um, resource of their grant tracker, uh, providing that free to all charities. And I know NICFA did uh, provide that free for a certain period for charities, but is there any consideration within the department for a more strategic approach in that respect? I think it's something that we are always, always very aware of, the fact that um, because we have a large proportion of very small charities here um, that are, you know, genuinely run by shoebox accounting and people, you know, doing their best in evenings and weekends, that it is very difficult for charities always to keep up. Now, NICFA do um, provide a lot of great services, but they are not the only sectoral body to do that. There are others out there. Um, and I think, yeah, it's something that has come through um, again on the, with the fund um, last year was that a lot of charities do really struggle to put together that financial information. And even where they can put the financial information together in terms of the maths, they then struggle with the strategic element of it, you know, of actually starting to work out how best to allocate their funds and plan, and plan ahead. We had actually, prior to the pandemic, established a, a pilot programme with NICFA to assist charities. Um, it was really on the back at that point of some feedback from the Charities Commission that a particularly small charities in some sections of the sector were really struggling with their annual returns, um, which, you know, again, should, should be their sort of treasurer putting together what is their income and expenditure being for small charities for the year, and some were even struggling with that kind of basic information. And NICFA did some one-to-one -one work um, with charity trustees, and I think just having that kind of helping hand coming, as opposed to the regulator, um, you know, having to come back and say that's wrong, um, to be able to have a, a, an umbrella organisation say that let us help you, let us show you how to do it, and give you one-to-one -one support, really, really worked. Um, I know that that program. Um, wasn't um, able to be continued because of obviously the refocus on the pandemic. But I think it is something that we could have continue to have conversations with the sector about. In terms of the fund, it's important just to say as well that we, we, we did in phase two um, have some support available for organisations to fill out their application forms as well. And I think certainly if there was additional support available going forward, we would seek to put that in place again so that, you know, prior to appli submitting application, um, potential applicants have somewhere to go 
to just ask those questions, you know, what do I fill out in this section and is this the, is this the right way to um, interpret our figures? So yes, it's something we're very aware of and something that I think is an ongoing um, strategic need to keep building that capacity in the sector as much as possible. Absolutely, I, I totally agree and I'm, I'm glad to hear the department have that under consideration because it's absolutely crucial that we provide that financial support but equally so that, that strategic support uh, and building uh, and building the capacity within the sector uh, and the training and as I say I do know the wider sector, there is wider sector training support available but some charities may not be able to afford that within their own existing budgets. Um, just turning to the, the applications, um, and uh, there, there are a number of, obviously, the numbers and applications that were actually submitted in comparison with those who received funding, and you make mention in your briefing document there were various reasons why charities were not successful. Could we get a breakdown um, as to um, why char th those that were successful uh, and those that weren't successful and the reason for them not being successful, please? Um. So it kind of it would have um, fallen into various different categories. Um, we don't have a full um, final report yet from Community Finance Ireland because obviously they're still just they, they've made all of their payments and the, the fund is closed out in that sense. But they're just closing out their, their final data. Um, the National Lottery Community Fund, who delivered Phase One last summer, did report that there were a couple of, of quite stark categories: small charities who were applying. Um, without having read the detailed criteria and thought that they were applying for project funding. Um, and I think that is, you know, um, tricky that, you know, as much as you can do to promote a fund and say this is emergency funding, this is about deficits, it's about survival, you will also always have the small charity that just sees there's a funding application, let's just fill it in and ask for some um, money to, to, to continue delivering our services or do a new project. Um, the National Lottery Community Fund were very good in being able then to redirect those applicants to say, actually, look, you're probably better to go to our small grants program or to Community Foundation for Northern Ireland or others who were running that kind of um, support. So there was a, a large proportion of that people who were just applying without realising truly what the funding was for and weren't in need of it um, for its real purpose. Um, there were another cohort of charities who just were not able to present their financial information and that goes back to um, what we're just saying about that need to build capacity and we realised that in phase one that there were some who just, who just were not able to actually put together their own finances. They may have been in need but they just weren't able to demonstrate it um, and that's why we put in place the support um, for phase two. Unfortunately, um, Community Finance Ireland still reported that some applicants just were not able to submit the information that was needed to do what was a fairly straightforward calculation in terms of you know how much funding you needed um, to bridge the gap between what cash you had at hand and what unavoidable costs you needed to, to make. Um, but I think those were the main categories really of um, rejection. All charities that were eligible in terms of being able to demonstrate need were supported. No, I appreciate that, and I appreciate obviously all the information still being pulled together. But when that's available, can we uh, would we be able to forward correspondence with the exact breakdowns of, of how that yeah, sure. um, that is yeah. laid out? Um, and perhaps my my final two points. Um, there was a mention of the department's um, gap in the knowledge. What 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 uh, work is the department undertaking to enhance that wider knowledge of this of the sector? Um, yeah, so we're working on, we have a system as well called the Government Funding Database and as Ian mentioned then we have Nick, the State of the Sector report that are kind of ongoing um, kind of baseline um, uh, repositories for, for data that we believe both need to be um, considered. The third element that we want to look at um, in partnership with the Charity Commission is whether it might be possible to improve the way that charities um, submit their annual reporting data and their financial data um, to allow reports to be run from that because at the moment um, it's submitted as you know as a PDF documentation which means that we can't we can't run sectoral wide um, reports to, to drill down into the different types of income um, breakdown that charities you know different 
places from which they derive income from fundraising or, or trading income or, or grants and so on. And that would we think would be very, very helpful. But I think it is an ongoing learning process with the sector to for us to not just understand that global level information, you know, that is obviously very vitally important, but it, it's also an ongoing process for us to learn just how the sector operates on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we, we make a lot of assumptions um, that are not always correct. And obviously things are changing. You know, consumer demand is changing. The, the, the things that charities are needing to do is changing. So as they learn, we want to try and keep up um, learning with them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that then brings us back again uh, as a prime example to that capacity building within the sector as the department asked more of charities to be able to better understand the sector. Uh, it's important that the department then turn provide that additional support to those organisations for them to be able to provide that data and that information as best as they possibly can. So it's a, it's a two-way street in terms of uh, arriving at the end goal. Uh, and the final point, Chair, and I appreciate this, this will have to be uh, a broad consensus of the committee. Is there an option maybe for us to write the executive in support of the, the bid from the department um, for, for the sector? As I know it, it, it's very much needed. Yeah, I think that's absolutely. After this, we will be doing something that uh, will we'll certainly put that proposal to the meeting, but I would be in agreement with that, Andy. Yeah, I'm thank sure. you. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. Okay, I have one member left who wants to ask questions, and that is Karen Mullen. Karen, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ian and Joanna, for attending this morning. I find this very interesting. I'm supposed to somebody who was who worked in the sector for 20 years um, before coming under this role. I want to thank the, the Minister and the Department, as my other colleagues has. Um, I know that you have all worked tirelessly over this past while to protect or to um, support the sector. And it was really good to hear from yourself, Joanna, there, that bit of update in terms of, I suppose, over COVID, it's that, you know, reaching out under the sector um, uh, because uh, not... You know, there is many that's not represented by sectoral bodies. There is a lot of variables uh, in relation to capacity and other ways. And I'm sure you have learned that over the, the, he's picked that up over the last year. So it's good to hear. The fund was very much welcome. Um, uh, and particularly, I, I welcome that it did include hospices, um, including our very own here, the Foyle Hospice in, in Derry. It was very much appreciated. Ian, you had answered my question around future funding, and we just need to see that £10 million pound now, but supported by others within the executive. Joanna, my, my question is around you. You'd give an update um, in, in the briefing uh, around, or you might answer the question. It was around charities based here, but operating in other jurisdictions, and that they were able to avail of funding within those. My question is around charities based here that, that are operating in uh, third world countries, um, which we know who, who are very are suffering greatly at this time, at the height of the pandemic, and they wouldn't have grants within those countries. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of a charity based here in Derry, Children and Crossfire. I know that they did submit um, you know details uh, of the impact that it was having on themselves. So, just really, uh, is there an update in terms of? Uh, you talked about tweaking the criteria and future learning. Would charities like that be included in in relation to future funding or or any path funding? They were actually eligible to apply um, in to, to last year's fund in both phases. So charities that were local charities that might have been operating elsewhere were, were eligible to apply. Now, I can't tell you just off the top of my head whether Children Crossfire were um, successful, but if they were headquartered here locally, um, but might not have even been delivering any services here, they, we made them eligible um, to apply. Oh, no, that's good to know, Joanna. Thank you. Okay, Karen, is that you? Yeah. Just come back. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Andy, you want to come in? Yeah, just one final question, and, and apologies if you, you covered this in your briefing. The 75k um, cap, how was that arrived at? That was arrived at through a co design process that's. Um, with we pulled together a sectoral reference group, as we described it, which included Nicola Community Foundation, Northern Ireland, 
um, Charity Commission and National Lottery Community Fund at that stage and then Community Finance Ireland later when they were dispersing. And we debated a number of parameters around the scheme, which included a, an element of cap. And we looked at what we expected the need to be the profile of the um, charities in Northern Ireland, predominantly smaller charities, and also a sense at that point that all of the sector were saying this won't be enough, 15.5, no way will it be enough. Um, and therefore, we felt it was necessary to put a cap in to distribute the money as broadly as we could. 75,000, as with all these things, becomes a, an, a, an apparently arbitrary figure, but it, it, was, it was debated backwards and forwards what the sort of level should be. We were also conscious that there was a second, apart from financial need, there were a second set of criteria to prioritize applications if they went beyond um, the, the total budget available, which was really around ensuring a representative sector, charitable sector, continued to survive across those different geographies and different sectors of support. It wasn't necessary to invoke that second prioritization set of criteria. But the cap, I think I've seen a figure somewhere that there were around about 50, 54, I think, from memory organizations got £75,000 from the fund out of the 890 applications. So that will give you a feel of how many charities potentially could have justified more than that from their financial returns. And, and you've received some, some feedback from the sector saying that the 75 cap was, was too low. Would that be right? Some of the larger charities, so those that, those that got 75,000 were saying that this will still be a struggle. And indeed, one of the questions any grant giver has to ask is if we give them 75, will that achieve anything? So is there a value for money to give 75 when their need might be half a million? Um, what we do know is that no charities have gone, have not survived um, for reasons of financial um, hardship. If you like, there are, we know of one or two who have gone, who who stopped providing services for other reasons. Um, but yes, the, the challenge was always going to be if we gave ten charities half a million, that's a third of the pot gone. No, I, I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's, it's a difficult uh, and it's a difficult challenge to overcome in that respect. What what analysis is the department doing in respect of learning where those organisations who felt um, the need for more than seventy five? Okay, um, as to what services potentially they've had to reduce, because that's what I've heard across the board. Many organisations have had to result to um, reducing services and service capacity. Yeah, it's really important, I think, to make the point that this fund was not designed to support services. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds really counterintuitive. But because, as Ian outlined at the outset, we expected that there wouldn't be sufficient funding to save all the local charities, we had to um, we had to calibrate it um, as carefully as we could to support as many as possible. So the funding was made available to charities for unavoidable costs, and that meant that if they could reduce or stop services for the period of the crisis, then they needed to do that. Um, we were really just providing funding for them to survive in as sort of dormant a state as possible to get through. Um, and I think that's where we, we haven't had loud calls um, about the cap from the sector. Um, as Ian says, no charities were forced to close as a result of the pandemic up to the 31st of March. So the 75 proved to be enough to let people you know, perhaps limp through, you know, through. Um, that meant that some charities have said, look, all right, that was all very well. You, you allowed us to survive. You know, we had to stop delivering services um, in some cases. And that, therefore, has had a negative impact on some of our beneficiaries. And so really the calls for larger um, awards have been around the, the idea that we would support um, service delivery. Now, that does need to be considered and we will look at that. But it needs to be considered in the round, A, whether there would ever be enough funding to support all of the service delivery that charities would want to undertake, and also whether um, other departments who would have the policy remit for most of those services, um, you know, how, how we would work that out from a policy point of view, because obviously, for instance, health and others would have the, 
um, interest in, in how to prioritize service delivery. So that would need to be very much a cross departmental conversation. Um, it's something we'll look at, but I think the difficulty is the quantum of support that would be needed to um, support all of those services really could be quite um, enormous. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I know every fund will have their own policy directive, but how does the, the 75k cap compare with other funds within the department um, where there weren't, were no caps? We have caps in, in terms of the COVID um, survival, that you know, that kind of really emergency funding for COVID support funds. There were caps. Um, so the social enterprise fund also applied a cap at 75,000. Um, we applied caps for the arts and heritage um, support as well, albeit larger caps because we were very large commercial organizations, obviously, to be supported there. But the caps were really always um, put in place on the basis that we wanted to try and support as many organizations as possible. No, totally. And it's, it's good to see that the vast array of organisations were, were supported through this fund. Um, is there any analysis um, being undertaken with other departments to better understand where there was a reduction in services and were they maybe seeing an increase in the demand for, for statutory services? Yeah, we've definitely had feedback from the sector that not only did some organisations need to sort of stop or pause or reduce services because just in order to survive, but also that obviously some parts of the sector really did experience increases in demand, particularly, unsurprisingly, respiratory services and services related to the actual um, COVID disease itself. But also some of those other, um, you know, fairly well promoted um, publicly um, parts of the sector, like um, domestic abuse charities and so on, that saw an increase in, in demand during the period. So, um, again, it's something that we... Um, have committed that we would consider um, in, 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 in the context of any further additional support funding being allocated to the department. But as I say, I think it could be very difficult for the department to um, include support for service delivery alongside what really is was originally designed as, a, as an emergency support fund to just help those organisations pay their basic bills you know it really was about the things that they couldn't stop paying like their you know rent and insurance and and, and building costs and basic costs like that rather than um trying to get into you know the what could be a really impossible scoring matrix for services no absolutely um, and i think the reality of it is we hope to see organizations getting back to delivering their them services because ultimately that's why charities exist to deliver services um, to their beneficiaries um, no i'll leave it there chair um, thanks very much oh, thank you thank you andy that's some good points as well just to follow on from andy's point there around the specific services um, and going forward and hopefully coming out of this pandemic i think we'll need um, our charities more than we'll have ever needed them before. I don't think there's too many of us could put our hand on heart and say that our own mental health hasn't been um, compromised to one level or, of a, or another um, over the last year. Um, so I think it, it's more than ever we are going to need those those many charities as we try to to, to step out and away from from um, the restrictions and the pandemic. So I think it's uh, I know certainly this committee has from it started way back last uh, January, has very much um, been a great supporter of that entire sector. Um, look, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Mark has his hand up. Mark's just come in with his hand up. Mark, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Ian and Joanna for the presentation and, and, and all the, the work that they have done in supporting our charities at a time when they needed support to give support. Uh, to, to so many. I uh, suppose concur with uh, most of the remarks that most members have made. It was just a wee query, kind of unrelated. We, we all will be familiar with the adage that charity begins at home and, and understandably the priority is to help the charities that are helping people here. But I was just wondering in terms of charities that are based here, but who help people in other less fortunate parts of the world uh, there's a charity I'm sure you'll be aware of, Children and Crossfire, but based in the own constituency and just last Mark, week. Mark, you'll, you'll find Karen mentioned that earlier as well, but oh, just go ahead. Sorry, someone had come in looking for something. <laughs> <laughs> something 
looking for something signed, so I was a bit distracted there. Okay. But uh, then, sorry to ask you guys to repeat yourselves. I'm sorry, Karen, <laughs> that I didn't hear the an- your question or the answer that you got. What scope there is within the department to, to help, assist, or support children in crossfire and, and others who might find themselves in that position? Um, so, Mark, they, they were eligible. We made sure that they were eligible to apply to the Charities Fund last year. So all local charities were eligible to apply, regardless of whether they were delivering services here or they were delivering services in other jurisdictions or indeed overseas. Um, so Children Crossfire, assuming that they had a deficit that they actually needed support to continue um, to pay on avoidable costs, would have been eligible to apply. I will check whether they were successful or whether they were awarded any funding and come back to the committee on that, if that's okay, because we have um, not published our list yet for phase two. Um, the, the list of awardees for phase one is available online, but I, I'll, I'll check that and come back to you on Children Across Fire. No, uh, thank you, Joanna. And sorry again for the repetition. Sorry about that. Not a problem. No bother. Look, okay, there's no other members have signalled they want to ask anything further. Um, then can I just then, um, Ian and Joanna, thank you um, for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. Um, and thank you for coming in and briefing the committee today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, members, we also know that we agreed earlier that we were going to get um, NICFA and CO3 in to brief the committee. Um, at some stage, I would say, in the not-too-distant future, just on the effects of uh, on the community and voluntary sector. So um, we'll be able to use some of that information that we've we've gleaned today um, whenever they come in. So, and Andy had uh, put a proposal forward that we write in support of the Minister's bid um, for the, the £10 million. Pounds. I have absolutely no difficulty with that whatsoever. Um, can I just ask our members agreed then with that proposal? Yes? Yeah. Good stuff. Okay, members, are you happy enough then that we move on from that agenda item? Yes? Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm going to then move on to agenda item 7, which is SL1, the Housing Benefit and Universal Credit, Car Leavers and Homeless Amendment Regulations 2021. Um, the proposed rule as it pay- is at page 68 of your meeting pack. This will amend the Housing Benefit Regulations Northern Ireland 2006 and the Universal Credit Regulations Northern Ireland 2016. Um, to change the age limits to existing shared accommodation rate exemptions for car leavers and for those who have spent at least three months in a homeless hostel. The car leavers exemption will apply up to the age of 25, three years longer than is currently the case. This is a beneficial change and will support community or continuity of accommodation and provides those leaving care with an additional three years to establish links build support networks and hopefully find employment. The homeless hostel exemption will be extended to remove the lower age threshold, those under the age of 25 who have a history of homelessness can face the same issues with resettlement as those who are older. Extending this exemption helps to support younger people to to secure suitable move on accommodation and assist the efforts to end rough sleeping. Can I then ask members, have they any comments or are they content that the department proceed to make the rule? Content? Content. Content. Thank you, members. I'm going to move then on to agenda item eight, which is correspondence. You'll find the correspondence memo at page 72 of your packs. Um, I just have a few items I want to bring up. Firstly, can I draw your attention to page 82, um, where you'll find a request from co-ownership to brief the committee on a new shared ownership programme. Can I ask members, are they content to receive a briefing at a future meeting? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Then can I ask you to turn to page 83, um, and there's a memo from the clerk for the executive office asking if the committee are content with SR 2021-114. The Department's Transfer of Functions Order, Northern Ireland 2021, um, which will which will be considering at its meeting on the 19th of May. This statutory rule impacts on the work of the Department for Communities. Uh, the order provides for the transfer of the functions under Section 19 of the Employment Act, Northern Ireland 2016, relating to gender pay gap information. 
um, from the Executive Office to the Department uh, for Communities. The rationale is explained in the explanatory and financial memorandum. Can I ask members, are they content with the rule and for a reply to be sent to the committee for the Executive Office? Content? Yes? Content. Okay. Then I'm going to ask you if you could look then at page 129 where you'll see a request from the Transport Pub Alternatives Group to informally brief the committee. Members, are you content to invite the group to the next informal stakeholder meeting? Mm -hmm. Kelly, go ahead. Hi, Chair. Um, to be honest, in my previous role when I was in Infrastructure Committee, um, I, I engaged with this group. Can I just double check what our relationship is with the group? I know that they mentioned the Boyne Bridge, and I know that they're very upset with the new transport hub um, and the changes that it will make there. But it might be worthwhile through the department if we could get clarification on the status of the Boyne Bridge, if we could, because... I know it's it's called the Boyne Bridge, but um, I think in my time on infrastructure, it was confirmed that, that that bridge is not deemed historical. But I would really like to know for definite from our maybe historical division if that's true or not. Um, and it would be really helpful in advance of that meeting. Okay, we can do that. Absolutely. Um, any other comments on that issue? Sure. Go ahead, Fred. Sure. Uh, just on, on that point, and I guess it's uh, been a long running uh, issue, and it, it may also be a good idea to get uh, some reading from uh, the local community itself uh, and, and, and Sandy Row, because I know that uh, there always hasn't been a meeting of minds uh, on, on this, so it's, it's better to have all the information rather than half the information. And uh, I understand that the Bridget, that uh, the, 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 the hub is talking about was built in 1936 by the Arbouts. Yeah. Okay, Frederick, thank you. Um, again, that information we probably do need to seek um, before any meeting just to, to, um, or, to advise the committee. Um, they are asking for an informal meeting, so it will be part of an informal stakeholder um, meeting, which we will have planned that we'll talk about that when we go on to our forward work programme. So we're happy enough with, with um, those proposals. Yes? Yeah. All right. Members, I have nothing else I want to bring up under correspondence. Do any members have anything further that they want to raise at this stage under correspondence? No? no. If, if so, then are we happy enough then with the correspondence memo um, with some of those minor changes to it? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Then I'm going to move on to agenda item nine, which is our forward work programme. Members, you've been provided at page 131 with a paper on potential briefings for meetings in May and June. Um, can I propose that we discuss this in more, more detail at the end of our meeting in a closed session because it is looking at our, our work plan, which is perfectly normal to do so. Can I ask members, are they agreed with that? Yeah? Agreed. Okay. I'm going to move on then to agenda item 10, which is any other business. Can I ask members of the any other business? No, there being no other business, I'll move on to agenda item 11, which is date, time and location of the Sorry, meeting. Sorry, Chair. So go ahead, Mark. Uh, it, it was just in, in terms of any other business and part of that will overlap maybe under the discussion on, on the forward work plan. Okay. I was just wondering if we, the committee, could seek an update on a couple of things, uh, one being the whole situation around the universal credit or job coach uh, jobs that had been advertised, you'll recall we'd been told that there, w we needed to recruit 1,400 and then it was agreed that we could recruit 900, yeah. of which to this date none have, have been recruited and I know they've been waiting on the, the budget being finalised to do so, but I have been contacted by a number of people who've been told that they've been successful in terms of the application process, but have no indication when or even if it's going to re result in a job for them. And that's not to mention, I suppose, the ongoing stress on those already working in, in that sector. OK, no, we can certainly ask for that. Um, was there another issue you want to bring up, Mark? Or was... I, the, the other one, now, I had asked the Minister this at question time the other day, and I should have probably ended the question by saying a yes or no would suffice. <laughs> but it's, it's just around the... PIP assessment contract, the CAPITA contract, uh, what, what the status 
is currently. I know the contract was due to expire in, in, in July, I think, and the Minister had earlier last year indicated that that contract would just be extended without going out to tender again. Subsequently, I got a couple of answers to say it was under consideration. But, uh, I mean, the time for consideration is kind of running out, and we know everyone around the table there at, at, at committee from, from all parties will have been critical of Capita's performance in that very important role. So I just wondering if we could get an update on that from the department. Yeah, I remember you asking that in, in question time as well, and I know we did get a letter from the minister or the department um, a few we or several weeks ago about the continuation of Capita, and I know members did raise their concerns um, at committee. So no, we can ask just for more clarifica clarification around that as well as to what the, attend the intention is and any work that has been, been done on that, um, if you're happy enough with that as well. Um, members, yeah, any, thank you, Mark. Members, any other um, AOB that they want to bring up at this stage? No. Nope. OK. All right. There being no other business, then I'm going to move on to agenda item 11, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. Members, our next meeting will take place next Thursday, the 20th of May, here in room 29, and you'll all be delighted to hear we will have a starting time of 10 a.m., next week so the well so thank you very much members for uh, for the meeting today can i ask you all to stay on um, we're going to go into closed session to discuss our forward work program this is the northern ireland assembly committee room 29 this is the northern ireland assembly committee room 29